Welcome to the 11th episode of the Game 4 podcast. In this episode, we will be discussing how to get started in board gaming. Uh, I'm Adam. I'm Matt. And uh, we're the people who, some of the people, who are behind the Game 4 app, uh, Game 4 Connecting Tabletop Gamers platform. It's not just an app, it's also a web right. site. Yes, it is. Um, which we just added some new features to recently. Yep, we have messaging now fully capable on the web. Mm-hmm. It was before only available for the most part. I mean, it worked, but not all the portions of it worked on the web version. It was mainly aimed towards the app. But now both things, uh, both are in uh, parity as, as far as that's concerned. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, anyway, Tabletop Gaming is what this uh, podcast is out. It's honestly, what we talk about here mostly is more along the lines of um, building community and how to... I mean, to some degree, how to get into tabletop gaming, but also how to build community and things like that, which is also what the app right, is Right, or expand your, your hobby. Indeed, indeed. Um, so what have we been doing and and, uh, and playing lately? What's been going on? Uh, so my, uh, my D&D group, uh, they have now uh, started to explore level one of the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Uh, so they've uh, they've explored probably about a half of it so far, which so it's a, it's a lot more expansive than even I thought it was. So. And this is again a D and D fifth edition, Wizards, yeah. Wizards, yep, Wizards of the Coast, Coast like yep. official, yeah, official campaign, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yep, in the town of Waterdeep. Um, but yeah, so far we're really enjoying it. It's a it's a good dungeon crawl for mm-hmm. the, so kind of towards that uh, nostalgic dungeon crawl, um, but a lot of good stuff so far. What's the um I mean, like, what's the MacGuffin? Like, why do they end up going into these these dungeons? Like, sure. The, yeah, the hook. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, so the hook for them right now is that uh, um, Volo uh, was helping them out in a previous the previous campaign, mm-hmm. um, and he's writing a book that they have uh, invested uh, some of their money into. That they so they're they're trying to help him write the book by finding out more lore. So they're, um, they're getting into publishing. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, because you know. They don't have enough money with their own tavern, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's the main reason. Uh, there's a few other uh, uh, reasons that are going on that only some of the players know. So, mm-hmm. uh, but oh. yeah, there's a few hooks of why they uh, might want to explore besides just the prestige of being maybe the first ones, first adventuring group to make it all the way through and find out what the secrets are behind the dungeon. Is it more based off of um, we we want we want to get more loot? Or is it more based off of like they're trying to stop some sort of bad guy? Nothing, or nothing, no active stopping. It's no, kind no. of like it's this uh, place that nobody's been able to fully explore up till now. Lots mm-hmm. of death and peril, so they're going to try to be the first. To so there's still it. some evil. I mean, it's oh but, yeah, there's but the, it's basically like a like a mountain they're trying to climb. It's just that the mountain is trying to kill them more than your average mountain. Right. Would. There's yeah. 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 Yep, exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, well, that's cool. So yeah, but I did I did pick up from our local game shop uh, store right before this uh, last session mm-hmm. uh, the uh, monster cards. Uh, so they're basically uh, they they vary between like playing card size and like recipe card size. Okay. Um, but they have every monster from so I've got like challenge rating zero to five, and I also picked up uh, six to sixteen. Are they the monsters that are basically in the monster manual? Basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But it just it's uh, I found it it's actually a lot easier to run, especially as they're, now that they're getting up into larger battles. It's less one monster is more you know there's like three or four. Right. So I'm able to kind of see all the stats and stuff without having to flip back and forth. Yeah, I mean it, it makes sense when you're like okay to. You know, in today's episode, well, or today's you know uh, session, we will probably just be fighting kobolds and maybe right. these three skeletons. So rather than having to dig through the book and pull out, you know, constantly flip right. back and forth between kobolds and skeletons, you can just have these cards out and put the right. book away. Especially yeah. now that you're getting ones that are like immune to this certain type of attack, mm-hmm. or you know, they get a bonus for this, and it gets a little bit more complicated than what I can just kind of jot down fast. So. Right, right, yeah. No, yeah, it's been, a, it's been a good purchase. I mean, you see a lot of that in, you're starting to see more of that too in, in wargaming as well. You're seeing more cards, more card-based stuff. Right. Because it, although I think it's interesting because you're also then, there's there's some companies that are also then just like straight up switching straight to apps, mm-hmm. which kind of bypasses the whole need to print cards, which I think 
I mean, I understand from the company's point of view why they want to try to sell cards because that's something, and right. it's harder to sometimes sell apps. Uh, Lord knows, uh, but yeah, no, that's, that's interesting though. That's I yeah, mean, I it makes like, sense for D and D too. Yeah, and I do like the paper. You know, like being yeah. able to see multiple words an app, you would still be flipping a little bit. Like but. I'm a big fan of not using paper, but in gaming, there's times when you're just like, like if you need to check a stat. And you're like, well, hang on, I, my iPad would turned off, and that's why I have to turn it back on again. Mm-hmm. The face thingy and all that stuff, or whatever. And then, and then, then, okay, there it is. Yeah. So just being able to have it on paper in some situations, I think, is also kind of nice. Right. You know, it's just uh, speed wise. Mm-hmm. But I do enjoy having it electronically. So if I'm someplace and all of a sudden decided ah, I want to think about this or read more of that or look at it, it's something that's already on my iPad. And it's right. Some simple. To yeah, do. and I do have both of my my monster manual and my DM guide on digital. Do they? Yeah. Do they have any kind of like? Um, Something like these cards, but something that's built into, say, D and D Beyond. Mm, not really. Other than, I mean, you can search and, and sure, pull yeah. it up, but yeah. So yeah, you, I mean, you technically can because you go to that page. Sure. Um, uh, within the monster manual, within or, D&D or, Beyond. Well, you can actually just search, search it up and go to that page. They have like mm-hmm. a, they'll have you know it's more like a Wikipedia at that point mm-hmm. then, but yeah, maintaining multiple at the same time seems still. Yeah. Again, you're still hopping around back and forth, which is kind of a pain. I get that. Um, what am I doing? I've got, uh, actually I'm leaving on Friday and I'm heading to Northern Illinois, Mm -hmm. which for us is a drive South. Uh, and I'm going to Elgin, Illinois to, um, Dragonfall, Mm -hmm. which is my first time at Dragonfall. It is a smaller convention that is, um, it is uh, mainly miniatures, okay. You know, wargaming, tabletop wargaming, but it is starting to expand a bit into a bit of RPG and a bit of board gaming. I believe. I don't know that they're doing anything with like collectible card, but interesting. But okay. they are starting to expand a little bit that way. So, which it's odd that it's called Dragonfall, though. That and it was started more towards miniatures. Yeah, I don't. That I, sounds like more of an RPG. Yeah, no, that's convention. true. As far as the name is concerned, that is interesting. Yeah, I mean, fall part makes sense because it takes place in the autumn. And right. I get that. But the dragon part, yeah, it just seems a little random. Um, unless, you know, Elgin, Illinois is known for its dragon population. Or it I, could I, be. I, I, I've not been, so I don't know. Um, yeah, but I don't know. It's uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's um, a, a very good friend of mine, uh, Matt, from Wreckage, from mm-hmm. Hyacinth Games, the Wreckage game, which is spectacular. Uh, post-apocalyptic skirmish miniatures battle and they're also working on rpg stuff too uh which is coming out eventually anyway he is the like charity lead guy for that particular okay. convention because they raise money at that convention and it's a smaller convention 300 ish people okay um but it's only been out for this is only maybe it's third or fourth year i think oh, okay sure. uh but they raise money for both uh child's play mm-hmm. and extra life Excellent. both um which are both which are uh, charities that are aimed towards children's hospitals. Uh, Child's Play is designed predominantly to raise money to buy uh, video games and books and coloring books and all kinds of stuff for kids to use and to pass the time while they're in uh, children's hospitals, whereas I believe Extra Life just straight up raises money for children's hospital research and and, know administration and all that kind of stuff sure. you know just to be able to make it so that they can do stuff that's great but yeah so there um he's been matt's been reaching out to tons of different companies all throughout miniatures and and i think some board games and, and rpg stuff as well to get people to donate and then there's going to be uh, i think a silent auction and a bunch of other stuff and raffle and all kinds of jazz wow. so yeah okay. so, yeah raising a bunch of money that way so i'm looking forward to going to that um i don't currently have any plans as far as like i'm not running any um, classes or anything like while I'm there or doing anything. I'm not teaching painting or teaching YouTube or any kind of stuff like that. Uh, honestly, this being my first year, I'm mainly kind of going to hang out and check it out. Nice. And then we'll see how it goes in the future. Um, and then, so that's this weekend. And then next weekend, like Halloween weekend, basically, mm-hmm. right around there, it's the whatever, the first, second, something like that. Yep. We're going to be, you and I both are going to be going to Game Hole Con, yes. which is in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So the, that's a bigger convention. That's um, role playing, and then miniatures, and then I would almost go board games. Like if you yeah. were, gonna, yeah, I would honestly say there's not unless, unless last year we missed something 
We could have. It I just, mean, it was, it we could have missed like an entire day, giant yeah. room full of board gaming, but we didn't see a ton of no, board gaming. No, just a library, yeah, area. Yeah, there was a, a board gaming library and stuff like that, which was which was well That's, attended. It did kind of spill onto the kind of the food area. Yeah, but oh, yeah. it did, yeah. But but like there was far more in the way of role playing and uh, a surprising amount of miniatures, honestly. Yeah. I thought. Kind yeah, of. obviously RPG, definitely the, the mm-hmm. top though. Yeah, and then decent vending area and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That convention's up over 5,000 people from what I understand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's no, surprisingly it's, big, but for how young it is. Yeah, because it's this is what the seventh year, maybe seventh or eighth. Seventh or eighth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think eighth. So, um, yeah, no, I uh, it's uh, I'm looking forward to going to to that as well. And we're mainly going as game four, and we're going to talk to people and check things out. Yep. And, and whatever. Um, Hopefully, play some games. Yeah, I'm hoping to actually get some interviews. I want to do. That's right. I'm working on this little mini documentary yeah tell everyone about that That's well yeah so uh when i was at origins this year um i was there teaching painting classes for uh whiz kids slash um vallejo basically mm-hmm. and so every day i would teach people how to paint these pre-paint or those pre-primed whiz kids things we would do like a you know a hill giant one day and the next day was a triceratops and stuff like that so people would pay and they would sit there and paint along and I had a microphone and stuff, and so I was teaching uh, 40 people at the time or whatever. It was okay. fun. Um, and so, but there was no class on Sunday. So on Sunday, I was kind of bored a little bit, like walking around the vending area and stuff like that. And I just started shooting like B-roll. So in video, B-roll is like if if the, if the video is pointed at us, like right now, if you were watching this on YouTube, you, there's a camera pointed at the two of us. And B-roll would be while I'm still talking or you're, you're still talking, we would cut away to a different shot of potentially maybe a thing we're talking about. Right. Maybe like shots at, at Origins or whatever. So shooting B-roll is basically like shooting your own stock footage that you're going to be able to put into your own videos and things like that. So I was just like, well, I'm at the convention. And I'll just shoot stuff. Well, I started noticing how many dice booths there were in the vending area. Mm. And, and it's a lot. I mean, it was a ton of dice booths. So um, I just started shooting a lot of dice and people, just a lot of shots of people like just hands reaching into big buckets of dice and people looking and, you know, expensive dice, sets of dice that were, you know, 50, 60, 80, 100 or more dollars. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point I did talk to one of the dice uh, company owners or whatever and he he had a die that was in his like apron, you know, he was selling stuff and that's where he keep the change and all that mm-hmm. stuff. And he pulled out a die in a little Ziploc bag that was a normal like 16 millimeter size like um what do you call it like a a, a six sider okay yeah but it was made out of uh, fossilized dinosaur bone oh wow so it was a hundred dollars hmm. so okay. yeah that was kind of an issue uh, i was like no i'm not gonna buy that because if i did i would only ever roll ones ever again so there's that but anyway so i got this idea i started rolling through my head about making a a, a, a documentary a little min, mini documentary about dice and about like how it's expanded and just all kinds of stuff like that Mm -hmm. so um yeah that's uh that's kind of um i want to get some interviews with some folks i've done a couple so far already at other conventions since origins and i would like to talk to some folks there um and get some of those things done as well so yeah that's um that's the travels for the next couple of weeks not super far we're gonna you know not driving more than about two and a half hours at any given time right still it's still still busy yeah and then uh i'm still also I'm working on some more terrain um, while the weather was still good. I was, there was some definite um, like decent weather so I could do some stuff and uh, get some things done. And um, I did that. So I got a bunch of priming done and went from there. So excellent. All right. Well, I think we have another question this week. Yeah. So, uh, and as a reminder, if uh, we do choose you to, uh, read uh, your question to be read on our one of our episodes uh, we do have a contest going on yeah we're doing a, a shirt giveaway so uh, we have a shirt if you're watching this on YouTube I'll try to cut in a little shot right here um, but it's a uh, special game for podcast t-shirt which you can't buy you can only get it from uh, we've we've pre-distressed it and the design made mm-hmm. it look like because it's kind of an older kind of like it, it's a design that reminds me of the 80s and um kind of the font size or not the font oh, yeah. size the font style and all that kind of stuff and like you know but i did you know I was, they matt and adam read my question on the game four podcast and all i got was this lousy t-shirt kind of a situation and so yeah it's um we will send it out to the people whose uh, question we read 
Right, and I believe a few even have, have gotten them, uh, so yep. we're looking for pictures of those soon. And mm-hmm. But yeah, all right. You want to read the question? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, let's see. So the question for this episode is from our friend Emily. Um, at what point do you draw the line from collector to hoarder? It's so easy to want to collect all the things. What are some strategies to keep yourself reasonably in check so that you don't die under a pile of board games, cards, or unpainted plastic? Um, yeah, that is a very good question, actually. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's it's interesting to, to like, uh, as a person who's got a basement full of stuff, I'm mm-hmm. not going to lie, uh, I don't know that I'm necessarily the best person to answer that question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think that there's something to be said about kind of knowing your own, um, what do you call it? Knowing your own kind of parameters, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Knowing your limits. If if it gets to the point where it's really starting to wear on you, and you're just like, oh my god, I don't know what I'm going to do with all that stuff. Well, now now that's a very good indicator when you should probably hit right. Mister eBay and yeah, yeah. Uh, and start sending that stuff mm-hmm. out. If you have a defined space and you're running out of that space, yeah, I mean, most of us do have defined space. I mean, like your house is only so big, you know. Right. Um, but sadly, uh, my basement is a pretty good size, so. Honestly, I could fit more stuff in there. Mm-hmm. I should not, uh, is what is happening. That being said, yesterday I took home four boxes of um, sci-fi zombies that I purchased from Mantic that had showed up in the mail, and so I put them in the basement, and um, I'll get to them. My plan is to get to them before Halloween of next year because I want to make a big... <laughs> I, w- I talked about it on my YouTube channel just recently. I want to make a big um, kind of scenario that is a bunch of people playing against just this wave of zombies. So I went on the Mantic's website and I found these boxes of like kind of sci-fi. They almost look like Imperial Guard, like 40K Imperial mm-hmm. Guard, but they're they're all zombified. And so, yeah, those are showed up. But again, it's one of those situations where I've got to like now, you know, I've got to obviously stay on track to get them done in time for next year, which shouldn't be super hard. But I also have to remember where I put them. That's also kind of a big deal. Yes. We did an episode just recently about uh, organizing. Mm-hmm. And I think that's also a big helpful thing. Like if it's just in piles everywhere, then it's much more wearing upon your psyche. But when things right. are organized. Yeah. And then uh, specifically, you know, be honest with yourself, I think, is uh, is a big item. You know, if there's a board game that you bought five years ago mm-hmm. and it's still in shrink wrap, it might be time to get rid of it. I mean, unless you're holding on to it for collector's value and you're going to flip it in 10 sure. years when it's worth something, but uh, that's probably pretty not. rare, yeah. Yeah, and even if it's not in the shrink wrap, I, I know that I recently went through, um, we talked about, I think, at the, one of the last ones about the mm-hmm. uh, reselling games, mm-hmm. and that was what I did was I, I've uh, kind of figured out what games I hadn't played in a long time, games that I've, you know, also you want to kind of worry about the nostalgic, like, You'll go, oh, I wish I had given really that game. I really liked it. So if there's a you know, good, strong memory of you playing with that game or mm-hmm. with a group or something like that, maybe hold on to that. But if it, you don't have any kind of real attachment to it, or if another game has kind of replaced it in your collection, you know, right. then you can kind of cycle it back out. Yeah, no, it, it's that that is true. I mean, it's, it's a situation of kind of knowing whether or not like you need, and I think it's different for every type of game too, mm-hmm. for, of the four genres. I think in, um, in in card gaming, you know, in uh, Magic: The Gathering or Pokemon or whatever, unless you've gone really nuts, I would think that you could probably store that stuff relatively easily. You know what I mean? Right. Like you get a bunch of those big white boxes, and maybe you got a big stack of them because you've got I don't know. I don't know how many cards even go in those, 5,000 in those big wide ones? The big ones are, yeah, I believe 5,000. Yeah, so, so let's say you've got 50,000 cards. That's a lot of cards. Um, but it's still 10 of those boxes, which is not huge. Right, yeah. And I, would, I would think, you know, at that point, if you do hit that limit, there would be some kind of, you know, you don't need, you, do you really need a, you, well, a whole yeah. box of mana? Right, exactly, exactly. But then at that point, then you compare that to, say, like, you know, board games where you're talking about big boxes, big and boxes. I mean, even in RPGs, I know plenty of people who have bookshelves full of RPGs, mm-hmm. but it's not taking up an incredible amount of space. Right. I think honestly, with RPGs, it gets to the point where it's like, well, okay, do you just have bookshelves full of books, or do you have bookshelves full of books and also tons and tons and tons of like dungeon tiles and terrain and all that kind of stuff? Right. You know, and um, and then that can become problematic for dice. Yeah. Oh, dice. Yeah. Sometimes no, you'll have like certainly. I have thirty sets of dice. I don't know yeah, if I no, need thirty exactly, sets, yeah. but uh, I don't know. It's a good question. I think that um, 
I think that partially it also depends upon if you are, uh, you know, in a relationship because it uh, comes to the, uh, to some degree, the acceptance of that other, that mm-hmm. spouse or whatever, you know, um, if you're living with this person and they're like, I can't get anywhere anymore right. because there's just board games everywhere or whatever. I mean, you have right. to take that into consideration. Right. Obviously. Or they might be like, you know, Hey, we can just make a couch out of this one. <laughs> well, potentially it depends on the, uh, stress level of the box, the, the cardboard and how that'll work. I don't know. Um, at what point do you draw the line from collector to hoarder? Um, well, see, now that's the interesting thing, right. too, because when you use the word collector, then it gets back into, well, I'm collecting this because mm-hmm. I either want to flip it later on and that's my but retirement I think, I think or that, I just want to hold on to it because I'm collecting. Right, but the because is really the important part there. Why are you collecting? Right, yeah. Are you trying to make money? If you're trying to make money, then if the box is not accumulating and actually going down in value, then... Yeah, then you're not making money. You're not making money. Right, You can yeah. get rid of that. And honestly, if you're looking to make money in the games industry, I would tell you to look elsewhere. Right. Just FYI, for the most part. Yes. yes. How do you make a large sum of money in gaming? Uh, you start with a... No, no, it's no, the other way around. Small, yeah, uh, how small, do you make a small, small fortune, fortune in gaming? You know, First, right. start with a large fortune. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's kind of the way that works. So... Uh, yeah, I, it's interesting. Strategies to keep yourself reasonably in check. Um, I mean, we talked about uh, money. You know, we talked about budgeting. Mm-hmm. I think we've talked about that. Yep, or we did. Talk- yeah. No, we did. Yep. And then, uh, yeah, tracking when you've played a game. Yeah. Uh, when you bought something. Yeah. Uh, if you bought, uh, you know, like you bought miniatures three years ago for a project, and that project is no longer now yeah. something you're interested in doing, then over time. Do post-it notes like affect the thing that they're stuck to as the residue? Uh, it gets a little bit of a residue, but yeah. not, I, I still think it, you can kind of wipe it off. Because I'm wondering if like when you, let's say you buy a game, you take it out of the shrink and all that kind of stuff. You check the, uh, maybe you do it on the inside of the box. Maybe that's the way to go. On the inside of the box, you stick a post-it note in there and then you just track like that way, you know, like yeah. this is when I got it. And then you just like, almost like um like the old school back in the day. I don't know if they do it this way anymore, but it used to be you would go get a book from the library. Oh, the library book, yeah. And there was like a little thing right. in there, the little pocket and the card. And then you could go back and see. Um, yeah, I, I actually went back and saw like, I, I swear to God, I looked at a book uh, when I was a kid that I think my mom had, mm. had checked out. Yep. Or mm, no, maybe that wasn't. No, I did that didn't happen to me. That happened to one of my friends though. Okay. I was there for it. He was like, oh, hey, that's my mom. Um, yeah, no, cause my mom grew up in Chicago. Well, no, she moved here when I was five. Anyway, any long story, but p- point is, is that, um, you could do something like that. And then when you start just going through some of these boxes and looking yep. and saying, Oh, I haven't touched this actually since 2016, I didn't right. realize that then it's something to look at right. for flipping. And that works more for board games. Yeah. And you can also, you know, depending on how you've got stuff organized, you could also do it kind of like a, like the, like a milk where, you know, the, you put them back or towards the right hand side. You know, the games you play, you put it on the right hand side, and then push everything back to the left. And so then the games on the left are the ones you haven't played in a long time. Oh, I see what you're saying. Sort so like, like the, yeah, yeah I like think at the, the at the grocery store, you don't put the new milk in the front because right. then the back milk goes. Yeah, and back. I think yeah, I think yeah, that yeah. strategies for like I've heard that for like your wardrobe and stuff too. Like mm, if you yeah. put all your shirts and what you're wearing on one side, then all the stuff you haven't worn or uh, flip the hangers the other way. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. Something like that. But yeah, yeah some no, kind I of indication that. that you haven't played it in a while. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to miniatures, uh, wargaming stuff, I generally don't sell anything that I've painted. So like once I've painted it, I'm going to hold on to it. And that's just a personal thing. And that's mm-hmm. just a decision that you have to make, you know, mm-hmm. as a person. Um, there are plenty of people I know out there that will build and paint and play for a while and then just completely sell everything. But if I've painted it, I'm going to hold on to it generally. I can't think of anything I've sold that was painted. I've sold stuff that I've built and not painted. But What about boxes? Sure. Like if things, if something's still in the box and I haven't even built it. But, but like, okay, so you have built it. Do you keep the box still? Oh, uh, generally no. Okay. No, I do generally. I'm getting better about that. Weird thing, uh, I do have a tendency to keep the shrink wrap. And mm. You're looking at me strangely, and I'm sure if you, yes. those of you home, <laughs> listening at home are also. So I keep the shrink wrap like in a, like a plastic like grocery bag because when you are trying to clean the glue off of your super glue bottle okay. and you get gunk all over the tip, yep. the, the, the plastic in a shrink wrap is like not as, as easy to stretch as, say, grocery bags mm-hmm. are. 
um, and you don't want to use paper towel to try to wipe the glue off because it will just rip and then you'll just have a, a glue bottle stuck, clogged up with paper towel leavens. Uh, so yeah, I, I hold on to that plastic because then I can put it on the tip and just twist it real hard and it okay. won't tear and it will pull all the plastic. So you're not on. like putting the string no, right back on. No, no, no. I'm just stuffing and, it okay, in the bag right, so that I've right. always got like a supply <laughs> of it. Yeah, no. Um, and I don't do it with all of them. Again, sometimes if it's like a little bit stretchier kind of shrink wrap, it's a certain type of shrink wrap that if it like right. crinkles a bit more, I'm like, mm, yeah, that's the good stuff. Mm-hmm. And I put that away. But the boxes, I recycle, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, again, though, what I, uh, but, you know, it's it's important to like, like that's really only doable in miniatures. Like you don't do that with board games. You don't go, Generally oh, I'll just take not. all the stuff out of the board game and then throw the box away. Like that's not the right way to go. Usually not, no. No, no. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's there's there's different ways. It comes down to your personal space, your relationships, your budget, that kind of stuff. And it does come to the point of where sometimes you need to maybe just eventually decide I got to get rid of this in one way or the other. Where you throw it on eBay or you throw it in the garbage or you take it to I don't know like a like a, a thrift store or a, or a swap or something, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's like you know we always talk about. It's a good idea to go to local conventions. We're going to a couple coming up, mm-hmm. um, but a lot of local conventions have auctions and, and stuff trades, like that. Yeah. And trades, yeah. So, yeah. So hopefully that answers your question, Emily, uh, at least to some degree. Um, yeah. And ran, if if anybody else bit. has any ideas, uh, let let us know. Let Emily know in the comments or through email. And real. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got some kind of uh, things that help you with your uh, hoarding um, proclivities, then definitely let us know. Uh, either via email uh, through podcast at, is it, or is it podcasts? Podcast at imgame4.com or in the comments uh, in the YouTube video if that's where you're checking us out. Um, so today's topic is how to get started in board games. And this is more your jam, yeah, for gonna, lack of a better word. Yeah, this one, uh, this one was tough. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. I almost went with RPGs first, just to ease. But this one, I've been banging around in my head of how you know how do you get into board games? Cause but board it seems easy. Like, cause you just buy a board game and there you go. Right. But, but there's I think more to it. Right. I think there's a lot of people out there that when you say, "Hey, I'm going to start playing board games," they go, "That sounds horrible." Wow. Because they think you know Monopoly, and they probably play Monopoly wrong, or mm-hmm. they think about the a board, clue or taboo or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah, Pictionary. There's somebody that's a taboo fanatic right now. I probably we're, we're annoying all of the taboo uh, podcasts and um, and blogs. It's a taboo to speak illy of. You, you don't want to do it. That's why nope. they call it that. Yep. So yeah. So uh, we're gonna try to do our best to uh, explain kind of different areas of it. Um, I'm also got uh, some suggestions of if you're you know an RPGer, maybe mm-hmm. what how you could get kind of more interested in board games because it is quite a vast genre. A lot of times when we talk about gateway games for other genres, it's usually a board game that's kind of that gateway. Right. Yeah. When I'm talking about, like on my YouTube channel, I just did a video recently again about board game or about uh, gateway games. And and uh, it was interesting because in the comments, a lot of people are like, are referring to like certain like kind of more beginner level miniature games. And they're like, well, I think this is a good gateway game. And that's at least the way that I've been defining gateway games as I've been trying to explain it over the years. That's not like an, a beginner miniature game is still a miniature game. Like mm-hmm. that maybe is where you end after you go through the gateway game. Right. You know what I mean? Whereas a gateway game bridges between two things, bridges between board games and say uh, miniatures in my situation is what Absolutely. I'm talking about. But, you know, it's also between RPGs and miniatures or whatever. Right. And in this situation, it's, yeah, there's the, like what's the gateway game that gets you into board gaming? Exactly, yeah. And and so, you know, the main, the main thing to keep in focus is that just because you've played a few board games doesn't mean you there that you've hit the right one that you know might interest you. Mm, sure, yeah, or yeah, you know, so or, or that just because someone says they play board games doesn't mean they'll be interested in, in the same ones you you are. Right, because it's not. I mean, there's a ton of genres. Right, like the, I would say, there's more subgenres in board gaming than there are in many of the other genres. There's yeah, it seems you to know be. more than in t- tabletop war gaming, more than um, RPGs probably. Yeah, so I'm just going to hit some of the the high ones, especially ones that I felt were um, maybe if outside of a board gamer mm-hmm. that you might not understand what sure. what do they mean when they say, "Hey, let's play like for the first one an abstract strategy." So an abstract strategy uh, normally means that it's a strategy game that has no apparent theme. Mm-hmm. 
So chess is a good example of that. Chess, mm-hmm. checkers, where it's definitely a strategy. You're you're playing against each other, but there's no real. I mean, a go. Is yeah, the one right goes or whatever. Yeah, yeah, there's so there's no real theme to it. There's no monsters or, you know, they do have chess pieces now that are, you know, different styles, but they're really not a theme to right. the, about. You know, it doesn't affect the game at all. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's a, what an abstract strategy game is. Um, another common uh, phrase is a roll move game. Roll and move. Yeah. Um, these are kind of uh, traditionally a lot of the hobby gamers don't care for roll moves mm-hmm. because of the amount of. Um, a randomness involved um, and these are where you kind of get more of your traditional like mid 80s 90s games like Mon- Monopoly's older than that sure, yeah, yeah. but Monopoly's a, a good example of that sorry where, sorry where you're rolling and you're pretty much uh, up to you know up to the, the random chance of how you're going to be going forward and then reacting based on that right right um, uh, the Euro game or a hobby game mm-hmm. so these are kind of what Traditionally, when you think of the board game genre, um, as we see it nowadays, is kind of what that whole encompasses is, is that. Right. And so it's a it's not so it's the the games that are becoming popular within gamers as opposed to right. within the general overall media. Right. It's kind yeah. of like the opposite of like the monopolies and the right. clues it's, and stuff like that. Right. That people it's, think it's when the they games think that are now the kind of games that are now starting to go into your your targets and, and right. stuff versus what you would have seen 10 years ago like yeah like not out. that long ago i saw settlers and i think pandemic and stuff like that at like best buy yeah which is like an odd place to have it but you know yep um and then you know so basically the thing that kind of sets those apart is that uh usually they, you know they'll have uh themes mm-hmm. um but the main thing is that it's uh tries to remove a lot of the randomness uh, so it's a little bit more uh, strategic, right? Um, and then, you know, down from that, there are, uh, you know, several. There's six uh, kind of official mechanics that are underneath them. Um, like subgenres almost. Yeah, but they're basically the, the different types of mechanics that you'll normally see. So if you see a mecha- this mechanic, then it usually kind of fits into that hobby game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like the first one is uh, tile placement. Okay. So this is kind of laying down land. Uh, Carcassonne is probably the one that's probably most people have heard of yep yep um and then there's also auctions so an auction mechanic uh so like power grid or stuff where they're you're kind of setting the uh the market but you're you know you're, you're bidding on on items to get it mm-hmm. um there's also trading negotiation so again trading uh like I have something that, that I need, you, you have something, you know. So like settlers does yeah, I was this. Say, settlers of Catan sounds like yeah. This, yeah, you've got you know yep. wood and I've got sheep or yeah, whatever. Yeah, civilization. Like and basically, a lot of the games that have that kind of trading mechanic that mm-hmm. you know you really can't win or usually do well unless you're actually interacting with with the people near you. Sure. Uh, let's see. Set collection. Set collection is another mechanic. So a set collection is basically, uh, you know collecting a certain uh, type or it's either all of a certain one or um or a like say you have a like for a traditional card game mm-hmm. i could collect try collecting all fives or i could try collecting all hearts sure so that's uh It'd be like yahtzee almost even uh yeah yahtzee would be maybe a good example of that go fish was one sure. as a kid um uh newer games like seven wonders has a uh fairly strong collection uh, aspect to it mm-hmm. um, and then area control that's another mechanic so that's basically trying to uh, control the person that's controlling the most amount of land is usually the winner um, so you're kind of taking over uh, so like risk yeah risk was a, good a little one bit more that. board game not, well, not board, a little bit more war game a little people. bit more war game yeah. usually you not usually miniature got, war game but like yeah I'm, I'm having a territories war. Right, exactly right, yeah, yeah. yep access allies yeah. uh, blood rage is a, is a more recent example of that from Kumani or not yeah yep yeah um, and then the last one is a worker placement or role selection uh, so normally this is putting out pieces um, and to accomplish a goal, mm-hmm. but you usually have um, more places than you have people resources to put there. And then you, typically you're competing against other people, you know, so like only somebody, somebody can go to a certain spot or if they go to the spot after somebody else, it costs them more or something like that. So sure. there's kind of a, 
uh, there's a lot of uh, give and take and, and risk assessment of you know when can you do that when does that make sense for you mm-hmm. based on your strategy to take that yeah now ex- uh, let me know if this is the case games are not specifically only in each one of these categories no these no. are all like these are mechanics like, that you could have a, easily have a game that had both set collection and also worker placement absolutely yes. yeah yeah yep. so these are all kind of like not categories of game, but categories of play style. Right. And you could technically have a game potentially, I guess, with all six, although that would probably be... That would be weird. interesting, but yeah, there's usually <laughs> yeah, some yeah. aspects of, of, of many of these or, or you know, at least a good strong one or two. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because I suppose having a game that only did just one of them would also actually sort of be a little boring. Yeah, it's usually a little bit one-dimensional. Um, right. And you're, yeah, you're seeing a lot of newer games kind of deviating from that so that they could kind of mix it up a little bit so trying to figure out of these different types of genres it's almost like in music where like once you've like i like country music well then here's a bunch of other country music you also might like whereas if you just kept grand grabbing random songs and going well this isn't like what i like you know right having the ability to kind of classify things saying i really love worker placement games and area control games but i'm not mm-hmm. super into set collection or whatever can right. help you to, to kind of figure out what the next game you should be playing Absolutely. afterwards. Yeah, so that's really helpful. Yeah, so yeah, kind of understanding that it's really it helps you not only yeah to determine what you like, but it also will help you when you get to different games going, oh, okay, so this is just an auction mechanic. So you're able to take what you learned from a different game and sure. apply it to the next one. So yeah, that's true too. So yeah. You're not constantly reinventing the wheeling. Right. Head. Yeah. You're so yeah, it, it will help you learn that game a lot faster and get into the game a lot fast, faster. Uh, you can also take some of the strategies from one game and maybe apply them to the next one. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and then I've got a few more kind of... Bigger categories. Strategies, yeah. Strategies that I you know are also kind of you know vocabulary for, for the uh, board gamer. Uh, party game. Mm-hmm. So party game is typically, like I said, a game you would normally play at a party. So it's sure. usually a little bit lighter, um, can handle larger groups of players. Um, so like um, Cards Against Humanity is a good example of that. Sure, that's a well-known one these days. You can get it all kinds of places. But yeah, old ones, categories was a, was one like that. Uh, phase 10, mm-hmm. you know. A yeah, lot of I those, mean, stuff. those make sense. Like you would not sit down necessarily, well... You wouldn't normally go to a game convention and sit down and say, like, all right, we're going to play Pictionary. You know what I mean? Like, that's right. not a thing. Like, it's more generally, like, I mean, I've played Pictionary. <clears throat> it's always been at, like, Christmas or Thanksgiving or some other kind of, you know, shindig. So, yeah, that makes sense. Right. Yeah. Um, cooperative games. So that's a uh, verse rather than playing against each other, you're usually working towards a common goal. Mm-hmm. Um, this would be, like, Pandemic is a good example of this. Yeah. Um, Captain Sonar is kind of a, uh, again, a lot of these games will kind of branch into multiple. So Captain sure. Sonar is a cooperative game, but also team based. And it's also kind of a party game because you typically need about eight people to play. Right, right. Um, so and cooperative games work better generally when like, and I've had friends who have been like, my gaming group, we can only play cooperative games because if we play adversarial games, then feelings get hurt and there's problems mm-hmm. and this and that and the other thing. And so, yeah. So, yeah, there's some times when the cooperative stuff is a big benefit beyond just being a different play style. Right. But actually, it just works better within your particular play group because of your dynamics. Or yeah, I found it works really well with, like, my kids. Sure. Because I don't have to feel like I'm competing against them. Yeah, yeah. We're yeah. kind of working, you know, together to, to, to beat the game versus trying right. to be overpower them. So I have to, you know, play a little bit easier or somehow mm. change it up so that, you know, I don't crush them and make them hate games. Well, you could probably crush them, though. I hope so. Yeah, yeah, maybe not. no, definitely. But maybe not. That's I why you have kids, from what I understand. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, and then also uh, the 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 disbenefit, uh, you'll sometimes hear the word uh, like an alpha gamer. Mm-hmm. Uh, cooperative sometimes suffers more from that, uh, where you'll have like one person who usually is really into strategies or max maximizing, minimizing, which basically means trying to find the absolute ultimate way to get the most amount of points, most the least efficient. amount of time. Yeah, most efficient. Yep. Um, that they might, you know, you know, try to dictate to everybody. Well, this is what we should do, sure. Versus right. letting the whole team cooperate. Everyone else is kind of like they're moving their pieces and just kind of following what the one person's doing. Right. So. Exactly. Yeah. No. I mean, and again, that also comes back down to group dynamic and knowing your group dynamic to mm-hmm. some degree. Yeah. And then uh, the last kind of a good vocab uh, for a board game type is asymmetric. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, so that means, so uh, if you take a symmetric game like chess, uh, pretty much you're the same exact on either side. Right, it's like a mirror. Right. Right. Asymmetric, each uh, kind of like per, uh, player has kind of something that maybe is an advantage and then usually something that's kind of a disadvantage so that you can kind of have a different style for each, each one. So if it was like chess, you could have maybe one person who had twice as many pawns but fewer big pieces than sure, the opponent. Yeah, something the like opponent that, yeah. had fewer pawns and you know that kind of thing or something along right. those lines. Right. So yeah, typically those games They should are, be equal sort of, but right. differently equal. Right. Usually try to balance it so that you could win about the same amount of times either way. Right. Uh, you know, the same skilled player, but they're they've got different uh, mechanics usually that kind of make, you know, might help someone so that, you know, even within a uh the board game genre they might like a certain type of strategy when they're playing mm-hmm. those type of games sure um so that's helpful to, uh that way mm-hmm. yeah, that makes sense so yeah that's kind of the like so quick. knowing all of these different things th- this type of vocabulary and doing this kind of research up front can help you to well partially what it's doing is it's helping you to pick games to play and try and potentially buy right or to at least understand when someone says Oh, this game is kind of like this. And right. You can say, oh, "Okay, I at least understand yeah. what it is." Nearly and any kind of hobby or group has some sort of affiliated jargon, mm-hmm. and when that, if you don't understand the jargon, and they start talking about something, like I, in miniatures, I talk about the word. I use the word "sculpt," like n- not as a verb, but as a noun. Like this okay. is a good sculpt, mm. and I've had people been like, "I don't know what you're talking about." I'm like, "Well, the it's a little sculpture of a thing, and it's." Within our group, it's just known as a sculpt, not mm-hmm. known as a you know as a sculpture. Absolutely, so sculpture is a big thing that you see in the in museum. Right. So yeah, knowing those types of um, words for board gaming and things like that, and there's way more than we've touched on. Here, oh yeah, obviously. far far more. But these are kind of the big ones. Yeah, these are kind of the ones that you'll probably hit most commonly. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I miss one, please fill me in. <laughs> sure, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then, okay, so you're ready. You now understand the jargon you for board handle games. a little bit on that. Yeah. yeah. So where do you go? Where do you go to play? Um, obviously, uh, game stores are a great tool. They usually, um, but also conventions and, and local board game groups. Mm-hmm. Uh, normally, I mean, you don't need anything to show up to play. That is one of the biggest benefits about board gaming, in my opinion, is mm-hmm. that yeah, it's generally there's one box, someone owns it, it, you open it up, and everybody gets to play. Different than say rpgs to some degree definitely mm-hmm. different than like collectible card games you like you're expected to have your own deck right generally when you come to play mm-hmm. you may bump into someone who wants to teach and has a deck for you to try out but yeah it's everybody kind of brings their own stuff mm-hmm. and usually the person that owns it or you know has an you know can teach you how to play as well sure right yeah yeah um yeah no definitely like i i think that i mean i see I don't see it as much at stores, at least not in our local area. There are stores that do have board game night, mm-hmm. and then that's something that hopefully, if, you know, if you can find out about through, you know, let's say an app like Game Four, um, then you'll be able to hopefully show up and maybe either bring a game that you're trying to learn, or you'd like to play more people, or you just show up and other people, other people are bringing mm-hmm. games. But also looking for groups and clubs in your area is is big, um, and we've got groups and clubs in the. Uh, game for app so you can be looking in there mm-hmm. um, we've also got the looking for players uh, section in right in there so you can just say I'm interested in learning how to play Carcassonne S- Settlers of Catan Dominion you know like stuff like that right. this and so people who are looking through that area might see that and go oh this person should maybe come mm-hmm. check out our group or they should come over to this game store on Wednesday nights when we do board games and then yeah, that kind of thing so that's a good place to do it as well but then also conventions um, most of the conventions that I go to that are not specifically designed for just one genre, like, you know, when I go to uh, Adepticon, like mm-hmm. that's predominantly just miniature world right. but, but when you go to like Gen Con or, or, or any of the little local next, ones, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, um, you know, the one we're going to. Um, Game Hole Con. Game yeah. Con. You know, there's going to be all kinds of different stuff there and that's a great place to learn. And the reason that I think conventions are a great place to learn if you're going to go is because a decent convention has a list of events. Mm-hmm. So if there's a specific game you want to learn how to play, you can look through the events and see if somebody's running it. And then you can be like, oh, they, they, I've always wanted to try that game. And then you can be sure to mm-hmm. sign up or show up at that table or however they handle that. Exactly, yep. And then be taught the game. Like mm-hmm. it's very rare that I've seen at conventions where board games you're expected to know how to play. 
Right, and they'll usually tell you right from the get go if they're right. like, "This is you know more of a tournament, or this is more of an advanced one." Oh, right. Yeah, so, yeah. but yeah, yeah. If you're going to sit down and play like um, Twilight Imperium, and you've got like five people who are all seasoned players, and you've never played it before, that could be a problem because that's that's a, that's a learning curve. That's, right. That's not an easy, quickie game. That's a that's an all day affair. So mm-hmm. yeah, that's that's that can be an issue. But, but yeah, generally, if you don't see it, you can always ask the person running the game. Yeah. Hey, I don't know this. Are you going to be teaching it? Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, generally, it it is a play and learn. Any of. decent kind of convention, in my opinion, has in each listing a thing that's like player level or something mm-hmm. like that that says beginner will teach. Um, intermediate, you know, whatever, that kind of stuff, to at least give you the heads up so you mm-hmm. don't show up and go, oh, I already needed to be an expert at this? I did not realize that, you know, right. so that's helpful. But that that's rare. It's pretty rare, again, like you right. said, tournaments and stuff. Right, so yeah, so you, so you started finding some games you like. Mm-hmm. Now, the one pitfall is don't buy them all. We've done a little episode about that, actually, and uh, we answered really a question about hoarding, earlier. Yes, yeah, yes. about hoarding, uh, and it is a it's uh, the hoarding is real, especially yes. in board gaming. Board games, yeah, the size, the cost, the amount that are coming out—you can't even play every game. Like, there's there perfect. are thirty thousand new games that come out every single day. I think it's only twenty five right now. Okay, but, well, that's a, you know. no, but, but in reality, there's I think uh, last year, if I remember the number, it was eighty eight hundred new board games. So, 2018? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, even the professional board game uh, reviewers who try to review as many games as possible oh, and have yeah. them sent to them still yeah. can't even make a dent into everything. No, yeah. It's, it is, I mean, generally, certain ones bubble up to the top mm-hmm. as far as um, popularity, sales, that kind of stuff. Right. Popularity and sales kind of generally go hand in hand. Right. So, in that situation, you know, if you are really, really, really trying to find some people to play this one very specific game that all that's very like you had to go online and buy it from Lithuania mm-hmm. or whatever, and, and you know, and you may have a hard time finding other people who've played it because there are so many different games out there. But you can still teach them, and that's the right. benefit I think of board gaming is that I can just open up the box and start teaching you how to do mm-hmm. it. I don't have to depend upon you to have already like also owned it you know right. and, and and built your guys or you know built your deck or whatever you know it's yeah it's, it's usually a, not a lot of setup right um, yeah you know mileage varies but yeah. and and but there is a risk of buying something before you try it too oh absolutely i mean and i know tons of i got tons of friends who are into board gaming and who own games that they've never played oh yeah i've you know maybe I'm they played it that. once maybe they played it once at a convention or something like mm-hmm. that and they bought it and they just never opened it up and right. there's probably even some people who have got own games that they bought just because they've heard really good things about it and just right. never. Or a it. mechanic or a theme really got yeah. to them or there was a good price that they were like, oh, that uh, seems like a good price. Well, my, I bought, this is funny, I bought a board game years ago when the Battlestar Galactica board game came out after mm-hmm. the TV show or whatever. Okay. Um, you know, the TV show reboot, not the one mm-hmm. from the 70s. And um, we had heard good things about it and I think I was at Gen Con and it had just come out or it wasn't even out yet. But it was gonna be coming out, and so I picked it up, and I, I like texted my wife or called her or sent her a letter. It was a long time ago. It wasn't so. I don't, I, I think I texted her, um, and I, I said, you know, hey, uh, what do you think? And she's like, yeah, that sounds fun. I like the TV show, and we, you know, she likes board games more than me. We never opened it. I ended up selling it to a friend of mine. Uh, okay, complete like it was still in the shrink. Like it was never like we just never <laughs> got to it. You know, so it's not hard to do you know what i mean to end yeah. up buying games that you sometimes don't play and mm-hmm. that's you know absolutely yeah um and then another good way to you know maybe not buy it or to reduce your collection at home um or if you just have anxiety of trying out board games with people who you know you don't know uh, you want to feel like you're a little bit more into it um a lot of the board games especially the popular ones are now becoming apps yeah or some sort of like pc game or or even right. like honestly my wife and I have played way more Carcassonne back on the day on the Xbox 360 than, mm-hmm. I mean, like, we don't own the game, but we played the heck out of the Carcassonne on the 360. Yeah. Yeah. The other big benefit there is it also takes care of all the math at the end when you have to count up all the yeah, different that parts. Is, that is nice. It's super nice. Yeah. Setup. Setup and stuff. Yeah, setup is, is way, way easier, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, like Ascension, I have, like, every card, you know, deck that Ascension's done, mm-hmm. which would probably have taken up half my closet if I bo- bought right. them all, but I can play it whenever I want uh, against the computer or with other people. Yeah, and that's the nice thing, too, about those types of apps. With If you're getting into board gaming, it's nice to be able to 
practice against the computer and get used to the rules. The and strategy is usually, trying out different strategies. Oh, yeah. So. I mean, secondly, you know. But, right. But initially, just like, well, how does this work again? The computer will generally t- teach you how to play the game. Right. And then you go, oh, okay, cool. And then when you show up, in most situations, you should usually then understand it well enough by the time you get to some place where you're actually playing the board game version of it, the physical version. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes there are slight differences. Right. Yeah, like I know that the video game version of Blood Bowl is actually slightly different than the tabletop version. Mm. Like, but it's close enough that if you're not paying attention, you can assume that rules are still the way they are on the on the on the video game, and they're not on the tabletop. Okay. So that was kind of a a little bit of a, as a person who played original Blood Bowl, which is kind of a gateway game between board games and miniatures, and then played the video game a bit. And then went into the new version of Blood Bowl on the tabletop again, and then found out that things did not translate mm. perfectly. Um, and then it took a bit more reading. Um, so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind if you start doing the, the digital thing a bit too. Right, that's a good point. Um, also, uh, a kind of a unique thing I think. Uh, I think well, all genres kind of have it, but uh, you know, board games have uh, expansions. I think that can really uh, change how the game is played. Oh yeah, absolutely, so, absolutely. So my advice is always, unless you're told like this game is not very fun without the expansion, mm-hmm. assume that you should play the base game. Right. Yeah, and Be- that has to do with when we got together to play a game. We were at a small convention in Milwaukee a couple of years back, and there was like a games library, which mm-hmm. is also a great place to be able to try out games. Right. Yes. Super great place. Like anytime you go to a small convention, if they've got a games library, it's a great place to be. Like I always wanted to play that. Let's pick it up and try it. Maybe right. Some people with you. Um, but we were playing some game, and in the box, it had not only the base game, but also, like, a bunch of the Kickstarter like, expansions. Yeah, like, one or two expansions, and and the uh, two of us that had played it before were like, oh, this is going to be great. And then we're like, what is all this? And we're like, oh, gosh, they have the expansion. And, and it, was it was all comp- mixed in. And it was all mixed in, yeah. and we're like, oh, well, it probably doesn't change it that much. And it was an absolute nightmare. And We took it back and got Sparkle Kitty instead. I think so. Yeah, yeah, we played Sparkle Kitty. Which, which had was, no expansions. No. We, which was also a lot of fun, especially when it's being played by three or was, was four. It four. There it was, was four, four of us. Four middle aged men who were drinking. That yes. Sparkle Kitty was a great card game to play, actually, as it turned out. But yeah, the the situation is that if like I you know, it's it's way easier to learn the base thing and mm-hmm. then start adding on versus trying to start out playing right. with all the add ons. Right. A lot of times the expansion is to breathe new life into an old game right. versus trying to fix stuff that's broken yeah normally that's when you see mul- different editions of the game that yeah. are fixing previous you know fault yeah uh but uh there are a few exceptions but uh for the most part try the base game first yeah definitely i think that's i think that's pretty good uh, uh advice um what else have we got let's see here. coming from different genres i guess is probably you know like yeah and we talked a little bit about that kind of gateway thing right so yeah if you're in a different genre um I've got some ideas of some games. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely not an exhaustive list. Sure. Uh, but just some that you know, might uh, tempt you as a kind of a gateway to try out and go, oh, I didn't realize that board games could do this. I, you know, I'm used to, again, Monopoly or Yahtzee or, sure, right, yeah. or Clue. Um, so for miniatures, uh, I've got uh, Psy and uh, Imperial Salt. Yeah, I mean, Imperial Salt, yeah. I mean, that's, a, that, that, that's starting to head you towards board gaminess a little bit mm-hmm. um i think that zombicide is also a good one in there is a great one too. yeah um and then scythe is uh scythe is i mean there's there's a bunch of miniatures in it right but it's not yeah you still are doing area control there yeah. is some combat yeah. um but it is starting to get into resource management and engine building um, yeah stuff like that so, so i it, think that that part is definitely the part that's going to be new and different to your miniature players. right yeah yeah so the um rpgs uh Gloomhaven is a, is a great one. Um, it, you know, I would. It's an expensive one, so probably not one you're going to buy right off the gate uh, if you haven't done any board games before. Um, but I know that there's. Yeah, no, I can see that not being your first board game. Right, but I've, I I know that at least one guy in my board game group just started playing Gloomhaven. Mm-hmm. Um, he was a big RPG or not a big board gamer, um, and like the fact that it was a little bit more on the rails, so it was kind of more lightweight for them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, honestly, Gloomhaven is a great, I think, game 
it's a board game. It's an RPG. It's even almost a little bit of a miniatures game. Mm-hmm. A little, little game. It's got miniatures in it, and there's like some. I mean, you got, it's a little dungeon crawly, isn't it? A little bit. Yeah, yeah a little bit. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, no, that's I think a good one. Uh, uh, Time Stories is another good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, they even sell uh, various versions. Uh, so after the base game, you can have, you know, additional adventures to kind of go on. Mm, yeah. Um, but again, there are some board game aspects to it. Um, and then uh, a lot of the legacy games, um, they you get to basically play those board games. So like Risk Legacy, uh, Betrayal uh, Legacy. Um, so this is a relatively new legacy. thing yeah, in the so, board gaming industry. Right, the idea it, basically with legacy games is that you, as you play the game, things will change on the board. Like you'll have a sticker and you're like, okay, well, if you, this happened during your game, take this sticker, peel it off, and stick it to the board. Right. Because now this thing here now does this instead of that. Right. And so it's modifying and changing. Right. Or open this, or, you know, you hit a certain milestone, all of a sudden you get to open this box that was been previously hidden, and now you have, you know, a whole new, you know, uh, race in your game, or there's right. a whole new component that's now part of setup. No, the downside is on some of those is that. I've heard people say, well, yeah, but you can only play the game so many times before everything's revealed. They say that, but at the same time, that's the, kind of the the point. Yeah. One, one, there's not too many board games out there that you'll play 30 times and, exactly. then, and then be like, oh, well, I wish I could have played this 60 times. Yeah, yeah. Because you could then buy another one. Right, yeah. Um, but even if so, it is a playable game at the end. It's just a customized version of that game. So right, right. you have a custom Risk game or a custom Betrayal game or a custom Pandemic game that's really has like kind of a history to it so you're you, you know it's think, kind of your personal version of I it. I think it comes from people who are very particular about their games and they make sure everything is all their cards are sleeved and everything's protected and oh, all that yeah. stuff and they don't like the idea of modifying the game. Right. And I think that that's fine because you can play other games but the legacy games have gotten popular. It started with I think Risk Legacy. Risk was the first one that yeah. I remember. But then all of a sudden it became a thing and you see Pandemic and you see a lot of different games. That yeah, are there's legacy official games. legacy ones and then there's other ones that are kind of doing the same thing. There's they just don't, don't the, like legacy is almost the key word. If it's in the title, you can kind of understand what's going right. to happen. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, that's cool. I think it's even a trademark at this point. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, I suppose. Yeah. So yeah, but I, you know, I know that I don't. There's some things that say rip this card up, and I don't rip the card. I just kind of <laughs> put it into a little pile. Right. You just go. Yeah. So, okay. That makes sense. And but, then with uh, collectible card games, like there's a lot of deck building games um, sure. out there that uh, kind of can give you that building uh, a deck strategy, but also is built right into the game dominion uh, is kind of like that dominion is kind of like that uh, uh the old um oh gosh what the heck was it uh android and yep, um, android um, and netrunner mm-hmm. yeah uh paperback's a good one um your uh also the the legendary games uh so legendary the first original one is is uh basically marvel characters uh oh, yeah, built yeah, by yeah. upper deck <clears throat> I remember that. Yep. um and, and now they've branched out i know there's like alien uh legendary and uh, yeah, yeah. there's a number of other genres you could try with that, but that's a good one where uh, normally they're cooperative as well, so you you get to kind of play it as a group. Sure. Uh, but you're also building that deck and kind of getting that uh, edge. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's cool. So, yeah, I think that overall there's – board games are not – I would say that board games are probably easier to get into than, say, like tabletop wargaming. Um Potentially, maybe even easier than RPGs. Although RPGs are easy enough to get into as long as you have a good group to start with. Mm-hmm. I think it's, it's, it's easy to be pulled into that way. Right. And there's not a big um, investment money wise. Correct. Um, and, uh, and collectible card games, you know, but yeah, yeah. I would say that it's um, if you're interested in board gaming, you've seen other people doing it, you've um, played some in the past, but you're interested in playing more, definitely try to find a group. <clears throat> Excuse me. Try to find a group in your local area. Uh, use the Game4 app, you know, look around on other resources and try to find a group and, and start playing with those folks. Not only will you learn new games um, and new styles of games and new strategies to use in games and things like that, but you'll also hopefully meet some people that you decide that are, you like, you know, and become yep. friends and stuff like that, which is really what all this social tabletop stuff is really kind of about for the most part. So, I agree. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for listening to this episode of the Game4 podcast. If you've got questions or comments, and you're watching on YouTube, please leave a comment below. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're listening via your favorite podcast player or just aren't into the whole YouTube comment section thing, then you can feel free to reach out to us via email at podcast at imgame4.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And lastly, to find out more about the Game 4 platform design to connect tabletop gamers, 
please check out our website at www.imgame4.com. That is www.iamgameforcom Thanks. Thanks.